Hey friends, welcome back to Torah Love Women. Today is Shabbat Prep Day Radio, episode number 29. Hope everybody's having a beautiful week. Um, happy Thanksgiving to those of you who are celebrating coming up next week. I do have a Thanksgiving video getting ready to load this weekend for those of you who are interested in checking that out. Before we go into Shabbat Prep Day Radio, I wanted to show you guys some more skirts. So last week I loaded a bunch of skirts into my Etsy shop. And... Um, <laughs> they sold out like right away. And so I have actually loaded, let me get the camera adjusted here. A little better. No, okay, I'll put it right there. <laughs> um, I have actually loaded, uh, quite a few more in there, but the pictures are like horrific. <laughs> I just did them real quick tonight and it was after the sun went down. And so they don't have the best light. We usually like to do them outside. The skirts are not ironed, um, so it's just kind of messy. And my plan is tomorrow to replace the photos with good photos after I've had a little time to sort of fix things and take new photos. But I wanted to get them right up because last week I put up this video and I didn't get the skirts up right away. And uh, once I did get them up, they sold out immediately, but I had lots of people who came to the shop and they were gone. So um, I wanted to go ahead and get them up before I loaded the video, but you know, I'm human and one person can only do a few things uh, with my time. And so tomorrow I will iron everything nice, retake photos, if there's any skirts left to iron and take photos of by the time this um, this loads and um, and you guys have had a chance to check them out. But anyway, I want to show you what it is that I'm putting in tonight. So um, this one is just so these are all just like flared like this, right? Like A-line flared skirts with adjustable drawstring waist. Um, I have some smaller sizes tonight than I had last week. I still have a couple larger sizes, but I have more small sizes this week than not. Um, this one is one of the smaller ones. And then I have three of this pattern in kind of a smaller, small, medium sort of size. Uh, this was some vintage fabric that was given to me. Um, and I see, I don't even have some of these. I don't even have the waist string in yet. So, <laughs> but they will be in tomorrow and all will be well. Uh, they'll be, so <clears throat> I wanted to have them ready to be all done with by Shabbat, right? So anyway, that was some vintage material that someone had given to me and, um, I was able to make three nice skirts out of that one. And then these two are a little bit larger. This one, I love this fabric. I bought this fabric a really long time ago, probably like 12 years ago. I bought this and um, I was making things for a booth in a friend of mine's shop. She had one of those, well she had a salon and then she had like this little section where people could like rent vendor booths. And so I made like this um, kind of a prayer bench and I covered the bench with that fabric and she bought it up right away. <laughs> and now I regret it. I wish I wouldn't have sold it because I love it so much. Anyway, there's that one um, and I've only got one of those. And then this one is, um, this is the plus size one. And I think this fabric is so pretty. It kind of reminds me of Little Women, right? Where you have like Amy painting and you have like Meg and Joe over here in the garden, but um, that has a pretty green pinstripe and I bought this fabric like 15 years ago, maybe not quite that long ago, uh, when we lived in Seattle and I just, I never did anything with it. So, <laughs> so I'm putting it up in my shop. So go and check those out. Um, like I said, the photos, by the time you get there, the photos might be great, but if you're one of the first to get there, the photos are horrible, but you guys can trust me, they're going to be okay. <laughs> Okay, so today I wanted to talk to you guys about the idea of being intentional. This seems to be a really hot topic lately. I am seeing it all over the place. A couple of months ago, a friend and I were sitting, just visiting, and she said, um, I just really feel like I need to be more intentional. She says, there's so much on my plate. I really just need to be intentional with my time, with what I choose to do and, um, and do the best things and do them well, right? Was what she was getting at. I was like, yeah, I totally agree with you. I just have too much going on. I really need to call some things from my schedule so that I can do the important things well. So we had that little talk, kind of filed in the back of my brain. 
Then after a little bit I started making notes to make some videos on that. I was going to do a whole series on being intentional and intentional in different ways about different things. I kind of mentioned it in a couple videos I think but I didn't do anything too uh, in depth. But it's been something that's really been in my own heart lately and on my thoughts. I feel so overwhelmed a lot of the times but there's not a whole lot in my life that should be making me feel this way. I have it pretty easy and I can't just sit here and think about what thing is it. Um, it's nothing. It's nothing and everything. <laughs> my life seems really overwhelming and it shouldn't be but I think it's a lot of it is because I am not being intentional about the things that I should be being intentional about. So that's still back in my mind. Well, then Amy from Taurus Sisters, Amy K, she uh, announces the Taurus Sisters retreat that's coming up in May 2024. And the theme is women of intention. <laughs> so Amy K is also thinking along these lines, right? And so um, we have a whole lineup of great speakers speaking on different um, ideas and aspects of being intentional. So go to TaurusSisters.com, check out the retreat, sign up for the retreat. I'm going to be there speaking on being intentional about keeping the Sabbath and keeping the feasts. I am really excited. This will be my first time speaking with this group of women um, and it is a fantastic group of women and they all spoke last year at the retreat so I am the newbie <laughs> and I'm just really looking forward to it um, but it's going to be a whole uh, retreat of focused on being intentional in lots of different areas. And then to top it all off, Lee from Little House on the Mountain has just put out an intentional journal which I will link to in the description and so she is thinking along the lines of being intentional and she even talked about that in one of her videos uh, that she released in the last day or two which I will go into here in a second. So this is really on people's minds. I don't think that's a coincidence, right? I believe that it's led by the Father. So why? Why is our Father talking to all of us about this idea of being intentional? It's a timeless idea, but I think that He knows we are being distracted by the chaos around us, whether we are jumping into it <laughs> or just letting it affect us to some degree. He knows how important it is that we are focused. We are laser focused on his goals for us and uh, we can get off track, right? Even if it's just emotionally off track, which is what I'm feeling right now. I don't feel like my actions are out of line, but my emotions are whacked out. <laughs> I'm stressed out. I'm, I'm fearful and just, um, I don't know, I'm just always on edge and why should I be that way? There is nothing going on in my life that should make me feel that right that way right now. Um, so I need to be intentional and focused on his goals for me, right? He knows that when we focus on this kind of crazy chaos that it affects our lives, every aspect, right? It affects our home, the atmosphere in our home. It affects our family, it affects our children, it affects our friends. It affects our fellowship, <laughs> our workplace, wherever it is that we are. So we must focus on really living, finding beauty, finding joy. And I know that I have not been so intentional about making my home a sanctuary like I have in the past. I really need to get back to that and get better at that and let that be one of my greatest priorities instead of something that I sort of put off and just, you know, shut the door and don't worry about. <laughs> In that video from Lee that I watched uh, just earlier today, actually, she talked about how a woman has so much power uh, with her attitude, with her tone, with the atmosphere that she is setting and the places that she is at. We women have the ability to completely change the atmosphere around us. And sometimes we can use that in a way that is manipulative, right? Um, but we should be using it in a way that is for our good and for the good of others around us. It was, I'm going to actually link that video down in the description also because there was so much just meaty good truth in that video. Um, one of the things she talked about was how it is so important that we create the right atmosphere for ourselves just as much as for anyone else uh, around us. I've really been trying to do that these last couple of days. One of the things I've been doing is I'll get everything ready for myself to go to bed. I'll get my book ready. Um, I make sure that my bed is all comfortable, that my water is filled, that my book light is there. Um, just everything, everything that I need to snuggle down in my bed and go to sleep. 
after reading first, of course, right? And so I get that all ready, and then um, I get everything, you know, my pajamas, my towels, whatever. I go into my bathroom, I light a candle, and I turn off the lights, and I take my shower by candlelight and just get ready by candlelight. And that, and then when I come out, my lights are low, you know, they're dimmed because I just have a lamp on, and it has been a really relaxing way to sort of wind down to get ready for my bedtime. I only do that for myself, right? I'm the only one benefiting from that action. Um, and in the past, I have been cons just a little, um, not as not taking that as important as I should be because uh, if it doesn't benefit anyone but me well then it doesn't matter <laughs> but it does matter a lot right and so just little things like that but something else that I listened to this morning I just happened to see the title of this video it's like six minutes and basically it said you are depressed because you are bored <laughs> and I was like well, that's an interesting thought, and I listened to it, um, and it did have some good meat in it. It talked about how most people today have everything they need. They have every need met. Many people could live, like, indefinitely without really even having to leave their homes. Um, and a lot of people do, right? We have, can have all of our groceries and other necessities delivered to our door. Uh, we can work online, from you know, work from home. Um, have online relationships and online conversations. Um, most of the things that we need can be met in the snap of a finger and we don't have a whole lot of real honest true needs uh, when it comes to survival, right? Emotional needs and spiritual needs is a whole different story of course, but to actually just physically survive, most of those needs are met and they're met easier than they ever have been in history. With my husband working from home, we are one of those families. We really could just stay here forever and never leave, and we would still survive. Um, but we're bored, right? Of course, we still get out and do stuff and visit people and go to the store and all that, but we're bored because we don't have enough to do. Even more than that, there's no challenges, right? So I think, oh, I'll garden. I've never gardened before. I will take up this challenge of gardening. So I garden a little bit. I bring in a little bit, never near enough to feed my family, but enough just to kind of play around and learn a little bit about plants and that kind of thing. But what happens if my garden doesn't prosper? I just can go buy, right? I just supplement it with grocery store or farmer's market or whatever. Um, it's not one of those situations where if my garden doesn't survive, then I don't survive. We're not in that kind of an era, right? Um, same thing with, I mean, anything really, sewing, right? Maybe I want to make these skirts, but it's not a necessity. Like, it's not like if I don't make these clothes for my family, they will run around naked uh, because I just go to the store. I just buy what I want online. I just have it shipped to me. Like, I've thought in the past about how I just had this hunger to work. Uh, maybe I need to buy a ringer washer machine, or maybe I need to start, you know, doing all of my dishes in a tub outside, or maybe I need to start cooking over a campfire just to give myself a little bit of a challenge. So I have been trying to challenge myself lately in different things. I talked to you guys last week about how I'm trying to do one new thing each day. And I shared some of that stuff with you guys last week, and then I still have continued that on. Um, some of the things that I've done this last week that are new to me was I cut up a deer all by myself. My son got a deer, and my husband and sons um, kind of got him, you know, dressed out or whatever, and brought me big slabs of meat, and I cut it all up and packaged it and put it in the freezer. And I made jerky, and <laughs> we have a whole bunch of steaks, and so that was interesting because I'd never done that before, and. Who knows if I did it, you know, the right way, but I did it. It's done. Proud of that. Um, another thing is something that we learned, and this is just funny. You guys will have to look this up because I'm not going to go into detail, but you know how when you see like a, you're going to laugh because you guys probably know this, but I didn't know this. You know when you see like an octopus, <laughs> like a cartoon octopus, right? And he's got like his round head and then all of his little legs, right? And then his eyes are like here on his head, all right? That's not how an octopus really looks in real life. <laughs> In our kids' marine biology lesson yesterday, uh, we learned that that head is actually like a, um, oh, I can't remember what they called it, but basically it's the organs are all in this, okay? So you have like eyes that its head, where its eyes are, actually attached to its feet. And then this sac thing where those organs are 
is actually kind of behind. It's actually kind of behind the head. So an octopus really should have like eyes here and then like this big bulbous sack thing kind of back like this and then his legs right here under his head. But his head is just little eyes, just like a little thing, little, not the big old bulbous round thing. Anyway, go <laughs> look it up. Look up pictures of a real octopus. I don't know. Uh, like I said, you guys probably know that, but I was surprised. I was like, okay, I've learned this. <laughs> but in addition to finding things that challenge me, I just want to do more things that bring me joy, right? That bring me peace, that make me happy, um, that aren't dishonoring to the father, but they're just kind of enjoying his life and life he gave me, right? And I want to actually do those things <laughs> instead of just thinking about them. So some of the things that I have done in this last week or so uh, that just did them for the pure joy of it, I jumped in a leaf pile. <laughs> so Tuesday night we had some friends over. Um, our kids had raked up a bunch of leaves in the front yard. It was pitch black out there and they were out there having so much fun, our kids and their kids. And uh, they wanted us to come out and see the, the show, right? So the show was supposed to just be a couple of the kids were going to run and jump into the leaf pile. And, well, then they did it. We all clapped. All of us parents went out on the porch and, and Lindsay, big sister, went out on the porch. And so um, they all, the, you know, so the couple of the kids did their whole thing. And, and one little girl was our announcer. And so she announced them all to come and jump in the pile. And so we would clap for them. And as they saw that we were really, you know, excited for them and we were trying to kind of play along and make their game fun, pretty soon we got to the point where all of the kids, one by one, went and jumped in the leaf pile. Well then, of course, <laughs> they decided that the parents needed to jump in the leaf pile. And so the first dad got up there and did a cartwheel into the leaf pile. So he was like, super cool dad. Well then, of course, Jamie, my husband, couldn't, you know, let him show him up. So he did his jump into the leaf pile. And then they convinced the other mom to jump in the leaf pile so that I would be willing to do it. And <laughs> this friend of mine, being the friend that she is, was like, I will do anything if it's going to make Sarah have to do it. <laughs> so she got up there, ran and jumped in the leaf pile. And so, of course, yes, I went. And I did a little queenly march. They said something about being the queen. And so I did a little queenly march and swished my skirts. And then I stopped at the leaf pile and I said goodbye to my life. And I just went flat out. Didn't even catch myself. Just flat face first into this leaf pile. And when I uh, sat up, I was eating leaves. <laughs> Probably because I was laughing as I went down. It was super fun. Um, I hadn't played in the leaf pile since I was probably 18 years old and teaching preschool and all those kids buried me in the leaves at the park. But it was really fun and I'm really glad we did it. But it's just one of those little things that brought me joy, right? The rest of the night I was so proud because I was like, I did this thing with my kids and my friends <laughs> and it was fun. Today I needed to make a grocery list and go do some shopping and errands and so I took it down to the coffee shop and I sat with hot cocoa outside while the leaves all blew around me and it was kind of chilly out there and I made my list. Just something fun and different than sitting here at my desk making my list while I'm answering a thousand questions. I just left and went and made my list and then I went shopping and it was just I don't know, one of those things that I did that was fun. Just a simple little thing, right? It was like a four dollar coffee or cocoa and an extra 10 minute drive. Um, but I got to sit outside and just be in a place that was not super familiar and do something different outside of my normal weekly shopping list making routine. I changed my hair and makeup today, right? If you can tell, I kind of went a little strawberry blonder and got kind of pink and white on my makeup, sort of like I did when I was in high school. <laughs> just for fun because I wanted a change and I wanted to brighten myself up. I've even spontaneously booked a couple of trips that I will talk about uh, in the future. So just doing some things that bring me joy, that are fun, that are outside the routine, and that aren't things that I just normally do every day. We have to kind of play these games with ourselves, right? We got to get ourselves out of the rut and out of the place where we are depressed and out of the place where we are afraid and just feeling down and just feeling hopeless. Um, 
I wouldn't say that, you know, for a believer, we don't always get like totally hopeless and totally depressed and totally down, but we can get negative and we can get bummed and we can just kind of feel, Ugh, right? Just, bleh. you know, I hope this encourages you to just do a few little things that will brighten up your day. Things that don't cost anything. Things that just, uh, that you used to do, that you used to love to do and you haven't done in a while. Just do them. Just do one of them for today. <laughs> I challenge you over the weekend, <laughs> do something that is new or learn something that is new. At least something that you haven't done in a long time um, and see if it doesn't make you feel a little proud of yourself and bring you some joy. Another reason why we can sometimes get burned out is because we are not giving out, right? We are just kind of self-focused, um, inward focused, and we are not giving out. However, sometimes this can be kind of touchy because sometimes if we are giving out too much without taking that time I just talked about, we can burn ourselves out bad. That's what's happened to me lately. <laughs> As regular followers know, I have not been on the channel that much lately. I have taken a break for a couple of weeks. I put stuff out now and then, but not like I normally do, right? I have had a lot of guilt about that, <laughs> but I needed the break. Um, when you're in a ministry, sometimes you feel like you have to be on all the time, constantly on, on, on. And we just can't do that, right? Because we burn ourselves out and then we don't want to do it anymore and we're not fun to anyone. <laughs> so take a break and go do something else. You're not walking away from God, right? You're just walking away from that full time on ministry all the time. Because even if you're not actually doing ministry stuff full time, it's always there. <laughs> it's always in your mind and heart, right? And you're always thinking about it and planning things and uh, working things out and whatever. And it's just sometimes you just got to step back. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay to take a break. It's hard to tell people no. It's hard to ignore messages and phone calls and emails. It is hard, but sometimes we have to do that. And then we definitely do need to be ministry minded, right? And love people as much or more than we love our own selves. But we also need to have times of refreshing in Yahweh and in who he made us to be. If not, we will dry up, burn out, become resentful, become bitter, and then we will just want to quit the whole thing. <laughs> and instead of taking a short break, we'll end up taking a really, really long break. So it's all balance, right? <laughs> all right, guys, I hope this blessed you and encouraged you. This is the part of the video where we're going to read from Pride and Prejudice. If you're turning it off now, have a great week. I will see you soon. Have a good Thanksgiving if you celebrate, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Don't forget to check out those skirts. <laughs> if you are sticking around, we're going to do Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. We are in part three, um, chapter three, and Elizabeth has been to Darcy's home. She has met his sister. Um, he has a new appreciation for her and her family. She has a new understanding of who he really is. She's hung out with Bingley a little bit and has a different impression of him now. And so Elizabeth has a lot to think about. <laughs> All right, so let's start in chapter three. Convinced as Elizabeth now was that Miss Bingley's dislike of her had originated in jealousy, she could not help feeling how very unwelcome her appearance at Pemberley must be to her, and was curious to know with how much civility on that lady's side the acquaintance would now be renewed. On reaching the house, they were shown through the hall into the saloon whose northern aspect rendered it delightful for summer. Its windows, opening to the ground, admitted a most refreshing view of the high woody hills behind the house, and of the beautiful oaks and Spanish chestnuts which were scattered over the intermediate lawn. In this room they were received by Miss Darcy, who was sitting there with Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and the lady with whom she had lived in London. Georgiana's reception of them was very civil, but attended with all that embarrassment, which, though proceeding from shyness and the fear of doing wrong, would easily give to those who felt themselves inferior the belief of her being proud and reserved. Mrs. Gardner and her niece, however, did her justice and pitied her. By Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley they were noticed only by a courtesy, and on their being seated, a pause, awkward as such pauses must always be, succeeded for a few minutes. It was first broken by Mrs. Ainsley, a genteel, agreeable-looking woman whose endeavor to introduce some kind of discourse proved her to be more truly well-bred than either of the others, and between her and Mrs. Gardner, with occasional help from Elizabeth, the conversation was carried on. 
Miss Darcy looked as if she wished for courage enough to join in it, and sometimes did venture a short sentence when there was least danger of its being heard. Elizabeth soon saw that she was herself closely watched by Miss Bingley, and that she could not speak a word, especially to Miss Darcy, without calling her attention. This observation would not have prevented her from trying to talk to the latter, had they not been seated at an inconvenient distance, but she was not sorry to be spared the necessity of saying much. Her own thoughts were employing her. She expected every moment that some of the gentlemen would enter the room. She wished, she feared, that the master of the house might be amongst them. And whether she wished or feared it most, she could scarcely determine. After sitting in this manner a quarter of an hour, without hearing Miss Bingley's voice, Elizabeth was roused by receiving from her a cold inquiry after the health of her family. She answered with equal indifference and brevity, and the other said no more. The next variation which their visit afforded was produced by the entrance of servants with cold meat, cake, and a variety of all the finest fruits in season. But this did not take place till after many a significant look and smile from Mrs. Ainsley to Miss Darcy had been given to remind her of her post. There was now employment for the whole party, for though they could not all talk, they could all eat, and the beautiful pyramids of grapes, nectarines, and peaches soon collected them round the table. While thus engaged, Elizabeth had a fair opportunity of deciding whether she most feared or wished for the appearance of Mr. Darcy by the feelings which prevailed on his entering the room. And then, though but a moment before she had believed her wishes to predominate, she began to regret that he came. He had been some time with Mr. Gardiner, who with two or three other gentlemen from the house was engaged by the river, and had left him only on learning that the ladies of the family intended a visit to Georgiana that morning. No sooner did he appear than Elizabeth wisely resolved to be perfectly easy and unembarrassed, a resolution the more necessary to be made, but perhaps not the more easily kept, because she saw that the suspicions of the whole party were awakened against them, and that there was scarcely an eye which did not watch his behavior when he first came into the room. In no countenance was attentive curiosity so strongly marked as in Miss Bingley's, in spite of the smiles which overspread her face whenever she spoke to one of its objects, for jealousy had not yet made her desperate, and her attentions to Mr. Darcy were by no means over. Miss Darcy's on her brother's entrance exerted herself much more to talk, and Elizabeth saw that he was anxious for his sister and herself to get acquainted, and forwarded, as much as possible, every attempt at conversation on either side. Miss Bingley saw all this likewise, and in the imprudence of anger took the first opportunity of saying, with sneering civility, "'Pray, Miss Elijah, are not the militia removed from Meryton? They must be a great loss to your family.' In Darcy's presence she dared not mention Wickham's name, but Elizabeth instantly comprehended that he was uppermost in her thoughts, and the various recollections connected with him gave her a moment's distress. But exerting herself vigorously to repel the ill-natured attack, she presently answered the question in a tolerably disengaged tone. While she spoke, an involuntary glance showed her with Darcy a heightened complexion, earnestly looking at her, and his sister overcome with confusion, and they unable to lift up her eyes. Had Miss Bingley known what pain she was then giving her beloved friend, she undoubtedly would have refrained from the hint, but she had merely intended to discompose Elizabeth, by bringing forward the idea of a man to whom she believed her partial, to make her betray a sensibility with, which might injure her in Darcy's opinion, and perhaps to remind the latter of all the follies and absurdities by which some part of her family were connected with that corps. Not a syllable had ever reached her of Miss Darcy's meditated elopement. To no creature had it been revealed, where secrecy was possible, except to Elizabeth, and from all Bingley's connections her brother was particularly anxious to conceal it, from that very wish, which Elizabeth had long ago attributed to him, of their becoming hereafter her own. He had certainly formed such a plan, and without meaning that it should affect his endeavor to separate him from Miss Bennet, it is probable that it might add something to his lively concern for the welfare of his friend. Elizabeth's collected behavior, however, soon quieted his emotion, and as Miss Bingley, vexed and disappointed, dared not approach nearer to Wickham, Georgiana also recovered in time, though not enough to be able to speak any more. Her brother, whose eyes she feared to meet, scarcely recollected her interest in the affair, and the very circumstance which had been designed to turn his thoughts from Elizabeth seemed to have fixed them on her more and more cheerfully. Their visit did not continue long after the question and answer above mentioned, and while Mr. Darcy was attending them to their carriage, Miss Bingley was venting her feelings and criticisms on Elizabeth's person, behavior, and dress. But Georgiana would not join her. Her brother's recommendation was enough to ensure her favor. 
His judgment could not err, and he had spoken in such terms of Elizabeth as to leave Georgiana without the power of finding her otherwise than lovely and amiable. When Darcy returned to the saloon, Miss Bingley could not help repeating to him some part of what she had been saying to his sister. "'How very ill Eliza Bennet looks this morning, Mr. Darcy,' she cried. "'I never in my life saw anyone so much altered as she is since the winter. She has grown so brown and coarse. Louisa and I were agreeing that we should not have known her again.' However little Mr. Darcy might have liked such an address, he contented himself with coolly replying that he perceived no other alteration than her being rather tanned, no miraculous consequence of traveling in the summer. For my own part, she rejoined, I must confess that I never could see any beauty in her. Her face is too thin, her complexion has no brilliancy, and her features are not at all handsome. Her nose wants character. There is nothing marked in its lines. Her teeth are tolerable, but not out of the common way. And as to her eyes, which have sometimes been called so fine, I never could perceive anything extraordinary in them. They have a sharp, shrewish look, which I do not like at all. And in her air altogether, there is a self-sufficiency without fashion, which is intolerable." Persuaded as Miss Bingley was that Darcy admired Elizabeth, this was not the best method of recommending herself. But angry people are not always wise, and in seeing him at last look somewhat nettled, she had all the success she expected. He was resolutely silent, however, and from a determination of making him speak, she continued, I remember when we first knew her in Hertfordshire, how amazed we all were to find that she was a reputed beauty, and I particularly recollect your saying one night after they had been dining at Netherfield, she a beauty, I should soon call her mother a wit. But afterwards she seemed to improve on you, and I believe you thought her rather pretty at one time. Yes, replied Darcy, who could contain himself no longer, but that was only when I first knew her for it is many months since I have considered her as one of the handsomest women of my acquaintance. He then went away, and Miss Bingley was left to all the satisfaction of having forced him to say what gave no one any pain but herself. Mrs. Gardner and Elizabeth talked of all that occurred during their visit as they returned, except what had particularly interested them both. The looks and behavior of everybody they had seen were discussed, except of the person who had mostly engaged their attention. They talked of his sister, his friends, his house, his fruit, of everything but himself. Yet Elizabeth was longing to know what Mrs. Gardner thought of him, and Mrs. Gardner would have been highly gratified by her nieces beginning the subject. So Darcy has had a chance to put Miss Bingley in her place, making it very clear that he has no affection for her herself, but for Elizabeth instead. All right, hope everybody's having a great Shabbat prep day. I will see you all soon. Have a nice weekend and a happy Shabbat. See you soon. Bye-bye.